Jim had us begin the service by singing How Great a Foundation. And uh, let me just start out by mentioning <clears throat> that a lot of what we're doing these days on Sundays, and well, Jim Barber has mentioned, we're looking for a new man, a man that can come in and be the pastor for 15, 20, 25 years. And uh, just so that we're all clear, the man we're looking for, okay, take notes. He needs to be tall. Did you write that down? Okay. He needs to have hair. Got that? He needs to be young. All right. Are we all on the same page? He needs to be a nice guy. For once, we need a nice guy. Okay. A nice guy. He needs to know the Lord, love the Word of God. And so we are having a great time. And as Jim mentioned, what we're doing is uh, talking to quite a few men. And Terry and Jim and Ken and I talk about these guys. And we phone them, and we listen to them preach. And right now, we don't feel like we have exactly the right person. But uh, you know what? Uh, 40 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, maybe even 50 years ago, there was a guy born that was to be the pastor here at Eternal Life Baptist Church. And God has been preparing that guy all along the way. Isn't that great? And he'll be here, and he'll be the guy that will take this church on for the next 20 years. That's pretty exciting. But one of the things that I uh, feel commissioned to do is that when I have the opportunity, I want to lay the foundation. So when the new man comes in, he has something to build on. And so if you are coming on Wednesdays, you know we're going through the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going through verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And we chose that because Paul is talking to a church about how to get firm and how to get back to the basics. And then uh, on Sunday mornings, we're doing the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is God's book to us that's all about how to do church. It's about the early church, the first church. And so uh, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're looking at that. If you got a letter in the mail this week, you saw that on the 12th of July, in the evening, for those that work during the day and want to have a Bible study in the evening, we have two starting up on the 12th. One that Kathleen is going to lead, and normally what she does is she gets the ladies together and says, which one of the books of the Bible would you like to study? And so you choose. And then what I've done is I've chosen the book of Nehemiah. Why the book of Nehemiah? It's a great Old Testament book that has to do with leadership in the church. So I hope you can see that there's a little trend there as we're looking at Acts, 1 Corinthians, Nehemiah, and we're trying to do that. Now, uh, I'm going to ask that you, know, you put up, uh, Bethany, on the slide there, the uh, uh, First Corinth the uh, Acts passage, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, if you put that up there. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, and in the breaking of bread, and in prayer. This is kind of interesting. Across our entire world, country, uh, community, uh, healthy, God-believing, uh, Bible-believing pastors and churches are constantly saying to themselves, what can we do to reach more people? Every one of them are having the same conversation. What can we do? Uh, pastors are quick to go to conferences where they can maybe leave with a tidbit of information on how can we reach a neighbor? How can we reach one more person? And so they come up with all kinds of ideas. Sometimes the ideas are good. Sometimes they aren't. And, of course, Satan, he, he gets his toe in the whole process. And sometimes he gets us off on the wrong track. Sometimes when uh, churches and pastors say, well, how can we begin to reach more people? They say, you know what? We could reach more people if we had more entertaining music. Well, there's nothing wrong with music that's entertaining, but uh, that isn't the answer. You know, if we could have uh, s some real entertainment there. Somebody says, well, I'll bet we could reach more people if we would preach on current events, if we talk about what's happening in the world. 
And that's a mistake to go that direction also. Thirdly, sometimes uh, people will say, well, we could really grow, we could get real big if we had a real exciting kids' ministry. Nothing wrong with that, but that alone isn't really necessary. We could say, uh, well, I bet we could have a really strong church and move forward if we had a more powerful, emotional altar call. An invitation at the end of the service. You know, the uh, studies that we're seeing today, unfortunately, is that we've lost one or two generations and uh, in our families. And one of the reasons is because we have, in our churches, uh, at times, not always, we put such a strong emphasis on an altar call that we've raised a group of children who don't know the Lord, but they can tell you when they went forward. They don't know Jesus, but they can tell you when they raise their hand. They responded to an emotional altar call. I went to a pastor's conference on one occasion, and the pastor was training other pastors. And he said, man, I'm going to teach you how to give an altar call. And he said, this is how you do it. You get people at the end of the service to sing just as I am. And when you do it, make sure that you pick up the speed and the rhythm just as I am. You know, make sure you really sing it this way. And then what you need to do is you need to have a number of people in the sanctuary that are salted throughout the sanctuary so that when you give the altar call, they know that what they'll do is they'll get up and they'll come forward. And by virtue of the fact that they'll come forward, they'll encourage other people to come forward. And the fact that you're singing this way and you're giving an emotional altar call, it'll begin to reach people and people will start to come forward, and they'll line up at the front of the church, and people will really place their faith in the Lord. And as a pastor, I can't tell you how many times I have had the joy of meeting with somebody, and I'll say, uh, tell me when you came to know the Lord. And they'll say, well, here's when I went forward. And I'll say, well, that's cool, but tell me when you came to know Jesus. And they can't tell me. And so then what we do is we spend some time getting quiet. And we talk about Jesus Christ and how to know Jesus. So sometimes we make the mistake of saying, well, we could really get the job done if we gave an altar call. Altar calls have only been used now for the past couple hundred years. It's a fairly new idea. And then, of course, there's even books today on grow your church by using uh, marketing techniques, grow your church by using social media. But you know what's really comforting, guys, is that the Lord doesn't lead of us in the dark. He says, uh, here's what you do. Don't worry about all these things because uh, uh, I'll build the church. I'll grow the church. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, he was very pleased when the early church did this. In fact, a couple verses after verse 42, it says, And the Lord added to the church daily those that he was saving. But what they do? Number one, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's the Word of God. They continued in the Word of God. It is not by accident that what we're doing is we're studying the Bible one verse at a time because the power is in the Word of God. You know, it's the, the only book I know of that's actually alive. Uh, I, I just gave away some of my library. I, I gave away about a thousand books that I had in my study in my library. I still have another thousand to go. But uh, those books uh, are great books. Love to study them. But the only book that really has life in it is this book here. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I can never tell a joke that will be so funny that somebody will get saved. I can never be eloquent enough and... Uh, be enough of an apologist 
that somebody will get saved. But we, you and I can use the Word of God, and the Word of God can change a person, give them a brand new heart. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Fellowship. What is so great when Jim comes up here, well, Jim asks Jim to come up here, and or Ken, to come up here and we pray together. That's real true fellowship. Fellowship, a give and take relationship. We know that somebody has this need and we work together. We love one another. We take care of one another. Fellowship, real fellowship. That's koinonia, fellowship. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the word of God. They continued steadfastly in fellowship. And they continued steadfastly in the breaking of bread. That time when we frequently come together and as we take communion together, it forces us because the Lord says, do this in remembrance of what? In remembrance of me. Don't forget me. It's all about me. I gave my life. So don't forget to do that. Every once in a while, do this. And so they did that. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in fellowship, in breaking the bread, and prayer. Prayer. Do we believe that prayer changes things? I trust we do. Prayer. Prayer that where we cry out to God, God, we're on your team. God, we know that you came into the world, that you sent your son, not to condemn the world, but you sent your son that the world might be saved. And we agree and we want to partner with you, and we pray and plead that you would help us uh, reach, reach our neighbors. The other thing I want to take time to do before we get into Acts chapter 1 is I want to tell you my story, so bear with me. It's my personal story. Uh, I was raised in a church home. Uh, my mom and dad took me to church. They took me to church to Sunday school. They took me to uh, morning worship. They took me to the Sunday night service. They took me to the Wednesday night service. They uh, took me to camp. They got me involved in the church in every way they possibly could. And I loved church. I loved all the things about church. Uh, I went through a confirmation class where I learned the Apostles' Creed. <coughs> I memorized the Ten Commandments. I learned the books of the Bible. I memorized a lot of Scripture. I, I knew all of those things. I loved church. Uh, and then I was invited to take part in the church service where I would wear a robe and I would light the candles before church started and I would sit on the platform next to the pastor as he would preach and I was taking part in that and I loved every bit of it. I loved church. I loved church. I loved to learn all about doctrine I love to learn all about theology. I, learn, I love to learn all about uh, different scripture passages. Uh, and I wasn't saved. I didn't know Christ. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know the difference between religion and a relationship with Jesus Christ. Guys, all of us need to realize that much of the Word of God has to do with that dilemma. When we study the Old Testament, we see that over and over again, God is using the all of the ordinances and all the laws and everything that we read about in the Old Testament to be pictures. But every one of those pictures was a picture of Jesus Christ. And over and over again, what would happen is they'd fall in love with the ordinance or they'd fall in love with the stuff. They'd fall in love with the, the coming together. They'd fall in love with the building. They'd fall in love with all of the, all the stuff surrounding it. And time and time again, he would try to get them back. See, this is all about Jesus Christ. So it's nothing new. Not a bit. But... Uh, it's really, I think, refreshing to know this, that we, it's not a promise, but it sure says that the Lord's pleased with it. When a church says, 
we're going to build on a firm foundation. And our foundation at Eternal Life Baptist Church is going to be to teach and preach the Bible verse by verse, everything in the Word of God. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to be all about fellowship with one another, really knowing each other, being in each other's homes, inviting people to come to our home, knowing how we tick, fellowship, breaking bread, periodically having people say, you know what, uh, I needed that communion time to remember because the Lord was pointing something out to me that I need to get right, communion, and then real prayer. I mean pray, but we say, why do we pray, guys? We pray because we're desperate. That's why we do it. We pray because we look at what's in front of us and say, God, this is bigger than me. I can't do this, and so I must pray. I have to pray. I have no other choice but to pray. Uh, what we're doing here at Eternal Life Baptist Church is extremely exciting. I can tell you that my wife and I have been very excited with all the days that we are spending here. But I also know this, that we remind each other every day that what we're trying to do is impossible. Can't be done humanly. Now, we could think we're doing something, but it's God's work. And so we continue steadfastly in the apostle doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayer. Well, I got to the point where all of a sudden I saw, actually, in John chapter 3, can you believe it? We know the verse, John 3, 16, but do we realize the story behind that passage? Nicodemus was me. Nicodemus was a ruler. Nicodemus was a church man. Nicodemus was a Sadducee or a Pharisee. Nicodemus was a leader of the Jews. Nicodemus probably had memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. Nicodemus was religious, and Nicodemus snuck out at night to come to Jesus and to say, hey, I got a question. And the Lord looked at him and said, you know what your problem is? You got church, you got religion, but you don't have the new birth. You must be born again. Let me say something as sweet as I know how. Not to offend anybody. Uh, we're many of us at the age where we have grandchildren. Uh, let's not make the mistake of looking at our grandchildren and our children and saying, you know what? I know that they don't live for the Lord. I know that they don't have any interest in godly things. I know that there's no spiritual spark there. But I am so pleased because I remember the day that they got saved. find within the Word of God that when a person gets saved and they're born again, they are a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away and all things become new. They are born again. There's spiritual life that takes place and only God can do that. I'm saying that, I hope you're listening to me in a sweet way. Kathleen and I have five children. Kathleen and I have 26 grandchildren. Kathleen and I have six great-grandchildren. And my greatest fear is that they're church kids. They're growing up in the church. And I want them to know Jesus. I want them to be born again. I want them to have... A heart transplanted. I want them to be different. And I know you want the same thing with your family, don't you? Well, how do we do that? Continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer.
Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts 1. By now you've learned that I'm real guilty of not going real fast. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 1. Somebody reminded me <coughs> that last Sunday, I think we covered two verses. So we're going to do better today, all right? We're going to look at uh, a few more. But we're going to start at Acts chapter 1, verse 1. And I'm going to ask you to begin by uh, playing a little game with yourself where you uh, imagine, just imagine, use your own imagination for a minute, that uh, you are living at this time. And this would be about 30, maybe 33 A.D. Now we're, of course, what, 20, 20, uh, 2023 right now? So 30, about, about 33 A.D. is what we're looking at here. And imagine that you're one of these people. And, and, you're, and you're somebody who's been religious. You're somebody that has some understanding of the temple. You're somebody who understands the Torah. You, you're somebody that understands uh, uh, ordinances. And, and all of a sudden, you come to this point, and for three years, again, this is you. You, for three years, have had the privilege to walk with, to eat with, to sleep next to, to chat with Jesus Christ himself. God, in the form of Jesus Christ incarnate, comes to planet Earth, and he says, I'm going to come and be with you. And for three and a half years, he's with us. And, and we get to literally eat together. We, we get to literally hear him pray. Wouldn't that have been fun? Wouldn't you have loved that time? And, and then at the end of that three and a half years, to, have, uh, to see him go to a cross and to brutally die on Calvary's cross, boy, the confusion in your mind. And then to know that he's buried and you're still totally confused. And then he's resurrected victoriously from the grave and there's excitement, but there's excitement that's also couched in confusion. And then what happens is after he's resurrected, he appears to many of us. In fact, we find that at one occasion, there's about 500 of us, and we're all together. And he says, here I am. I am alive. Look at my side of the spear was. Look at my, the prints of my hands. Here I am. He ate with them. He fixed breakfast for them. And for, for 40 days, what he did was he appeared before those that, that had watched him and, and heard him as he preached on the side of that mountainside, the Sermon on the Mount. And they reflected on all that. And then he looks at every one of them and he says, hey, by the way, uh, I'm going to leave now. I'm going to leave right from this point right here where you're looking at me on the Mount of Olives. I'm going to leave in a cloud. In just a few minutes, I'm going to leave. But then I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back in the same way that I leave. I'm going to come back. But I've got some really, really, really good news. But what could be better news? I mean, this is already great news that he died and he was buried and he's been resurrected victorious from the grave. And when we open it up to the book of Acts here, we find that the good news is, he says, but guess what? Where I had spent 30 years or 33 years on planet Earth in one body, one body that's now ascended up into heaven, from now on, for a period of time, I'm still going to be here on planet Earth. But guess what? I'm going to live in you. I'm going to live in you. I'm, I'm going to use your hands. I'm going to use your feet. I'm literally going to live in you. Boy, that had to rock their boat. Talk about confusion. How's that going to work? And then he said, okay, now we've been together for 40 days. I'm leaving. Now I want you to get off to the side. And I want you to pray for a while. And uh, then we know that after 10 days, he fulfilled that promise. After 10 days, Jesus Christ 
in the person of the Holy Spirit, came and said, you will now be the comforter. I'll live in you. Wow. Acts 1.1. The former account I made, O Theophilus. What account? Luke is writing here. Luke had written the gospel according to Luke. Luke was a medical doctor. He wrote about the life, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. And now he's move, we're moving on. We, we, we learned about Christ for those 30 years. Now we're learning about Christ from this point on. The formal account, oh, the- Theophilus, I think I mentioned last week, we don't know a lot about Theophilus. He probably was some uh, Ro- Roman dignitary, some Gentile that maybe had been led to the Lord. And he says, of all that Jesus, what? Began both to do and teach. Boy, if you want to do a study on that, what was it that Jesus taught? Luke says, you know, in the, in the uh, Gospels, we talked about, we reminded everybody of what Jesus was teaching. On one particular occasion, uh, in fact, we were just talking here, uh, Jim and Sherry and I were talking about uh, the, uh, the trip to Israel. And uh, it's so neat when you go to Israel and here's the Mount of Olives. And uh, in that area, there's Jesus. And as a rabbi would do, the people would stand as he would be teaching, and the rabbi would be seated. And the rabbi, the teacher sat, and the crowd was gathered around. Read about it in Matthew chapter 5. And, and there we find the Sermon on the Mount. What is the Sermon on the Mount? It is a sermon preached by Jesus. And it's the longest recorded sermon by Jesus in the Word of God. And he has PowerPoints, points he wants to go through. And at the very beginning, he begins with the Beatitudes. And the very first PowerPoint that Jesus points out to this group of people that are standing while he's sitting teaching, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What in the world does that mean? We know what the word blessed means. Happy, joyful, complete, satisfied are the poor in spirit. The word poor there, you look it up, it's the word bankrupt. What does bankrupt mean? I have nothing more. I don't have anything. If we're financially bankrupt, we don't have any money, we don't have, we don't have anything. We have nothing. And Jesus Christ starts out in his most famous recorded message in the Word of God, the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, hey folks, blessed are those of you who know that you are spiritually bankrupt. You don't have anything to offer. Nothing. In fact, anything that you thought was Spiritual and righteousness is filthy rags. All your righteousness is filthy rags. You're spiritually bankrupt. So here, the writer is saying, all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Sermon on the Mount is a good example of that. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them for how long? Forty days. We just talked about that. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Sometimes we get confused about the kingdom of God and trying to totally get our brain around the kingdom of God. Uh, I think an easy way to understand it is the kingdom of God is wherever God is allowed to be king. If God is king in your life, that's the kingdom of God. You're, we're experiencing the kingdom of God. God's reign, the kingdom of God. Verse number four, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise. Remember again, I said, they had to be a little bit confused. What promise? What better? Wait, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water. Well, the, uh, what I want us to see here, 
maybe this helps us out, next Sunday we're going to be baptizing in water, right up here in the baptistry. We have three young ladies and maybe others that haven't mentioned anything. To, by the way, if you still want to get baptized, let me know. Next week we'll do it. If you are interested in being introduced as a member of the church, let, let us know. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about that. But anyway, we're going to be baptizing here. And when we baptize next Sunday, what I'll have is I'll have Bethany, and I'll, be, I'll have my hand behind her back, and, and I'll have my hand in front of her where she has underneath her hand. And, and um, I'll say, Bethany, as your brother in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'll lay her under the water and bring her back up. And uh, that will not wash away one sin. That's not the purpose. The purpose of water baptism always is symbolic. The picture of water baptism is symbolically, in fact, I've encouraged all these girls to bring their friends. Bring your friends. Uh, when you want to get baptized, let them sit out here and watch all this because you're putting on a drama. And when you're getting baptized, you're saying to them, as I get baptized, I want you to know that I have placed my faith in Christ. This is a symbolic act that I have obeyed to God in in order to start by witnessing around the world to tell everybody I'm identifying with the life, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's kind of uh, getting out of the starting blocks as a Christian, saying my job is to witness, so I'm going to witness by getting baptized and identifying with water baptism, with the life, death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what about this baptism of John that we just read about? That's John the Baptist. That's not the uh, John that we read about in the Gospel of John. That's not the John we read about that laid his head up against the bosom of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the John who is the cousin who grew up with Jesus Christ. And, and, and John the Baptist, if you can just picture this, John, the, here we have all these thousands of people that come there annually to the temple. And they come there for Passover celebration, and they come there for other uh, meal celebrations and festivals, and they, and they know the Torah, they know the law, they know, they, they're religious. And thousands of them save up their money in order to travel to Jerusalem so they can be there for Passover. And when they get to this beautiful temple, and everything in the temple, this building, is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they're there, and they're all caught up in the pictures, and they're all caught up in the ordinances, and they're all caught up in, in watching these animals be slain and their blood shed, which is a picture of the fact that Christ's blood is going to be shed. And they're all caught up in that. And as they come here on this particular day, they're coming, and they're walking right past the temple, the beautiful temple. Why? Because God, our, our God, is leading them out into the wilderness. That's strange. They, they've come to go to a temple, and they bypass the temple, and they're all out in the wilderness. And when they get to the wilderness, they find a guy that looks like Tim. Well, maybe he does. All we know is that he... We, we know that he lived out in the wilderness, and we know that he has a funny diet. He dresses funny. I mean, he's an odd bird, and he's the cousin of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and they walk past the temple, and they come out here, and here's John. And John is not really one to mince words and beat around the bush. John looks at all these people, and he's looking at Sadducees and Pharisees and religious rulers and people that have done this year after year, and they're very much church. They're very much about religion. And he looks to all of them, and he says, listen, you I'm talking to, you need to repent. Repent of what? Repent of your religion. Repent of ceremonialism. Repent of churchianity. 
repent. You've been going the wrong way. Repentance means I've been going in this way, and all of a sudden, I'm assaulted with the idea that all my righteousness is as filthy rags. I cannot stand before people and say, I'm a better Pharisee than you because I obey all these laws and I pray louder. And when I go to the temple and I put my money in the, in the, in the, jar, in the container, you can hear it as it goes down to the bottom because I've done this all before men. I'm religious. I'm, I, I'm all, all about this. And John looks at him and he says, you are the guys that need to repent. And if you do repent, there will be fruit, evidence of your repentance. You're like us. I mean, he, he, he was not somebody that read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He said, you're like snakes. Religious snakes. Religion, you've been looking at yourself and comparing yourself to others. I'm better than you because look at all what, that I've done. And we find a real revival takes place out in the wilderness. John is dressed funny. He's not articulate, but boy, he gets right to the point. He says, repent. And Many, many, many of them do repent. And then he says, okay, if you repented and you're saying, I'm doing an about face and I'm turning away from religion and I'm turning my face to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who takes away the sin of the world, then be baptized. What? A Jew be baptized? Why would a Jew ever get baptized? A Gentile might get baptized to be a proselyte to Judaism to say, I'm going to get baptized in water so that I'll be accepted to be part of Judaism. But a Jew going to get baptized? Heaven forbid. And yet John the Baptist says, you need to be baptized. That was the baptism in water by John the Baptist. It was a water baptism that had to do with identification, a water baptism that had to do with a symbol of something else, a symbol of their repentance. Mark this down and remember it every time you read about water baptism throughout the Word of God. Just say to yourself, okay, now this is a symbol. This is a symbol. But then he goes on and he says here something else. Look at verse number uh, five again, for John truly baptized with water. That's a symbol of baptism, of repentance. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The word baptized is the Greek word baptizo. And the word is a word that means uh, total. It means surrender. It means buried. And, and when we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we do that and we repent of our sins, we are totally dying to self and saying, I need a Savior. We are baptized into Christ. And what he's saying here is that at our salvation, when we are baptized into Christ, we have the Holy Spirit every time will come into our life and take our place of residency. The baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place at the point of our salvation when we place our faith in Christ. Water baptism, symbolic. Holy Spirit baptism is God himself coming to live within us. Think about it. If God comes to live within our lives, do you think we'll be a little bit different than we were before? think we'll be a new creation in Christ? You think old things will pass away and all become new? I think so. Well, let me go on here. Therefore, when they had come together, verse number six,
he said, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they're saying, when you come again, are you going to then set up your kingdom? They were thinking about politics. They were thinking about a political kingdom. Are you going to get rid of Rome? Are you going to establish yourself now as king? Eventually he will. In the time he will come. But right now he's talking about a spiritual kingdom where he is king. But he's saying, I'm going to live within you. And these knuckleheads don't even kind of get it. And they say, so when's the kingdom going to start? When are you going to get rid of these government people? When are you going to get rid of these politicians? He says, hey, I'll worry about that. Don't you worry one iota about what's happening politically. Worry about your heart. You must be born again. I'm going to wrap it up here pretty quick. And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Verse number 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Why does the Holy Spirit come to live within us? He says, I'm going to send my spirit and my spirit's going to live within you. Well, that's great. I'd love to have Christ live within me. But why? What is the purpose in the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It's real clear. The purpose is that that we'll be a witness, that we'll reach people with the gospel. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And, I'm not making it up, look at your, look at this text. You shall be witnesses to me in Mooresville and in Plainfield and in Bargersville and in Martinsville and into the end of the earth. My power, my message, I literally will live within you. And the purpose is not for you to feel, oh man, I've got Christ living. The purpose is now you have the ability to go out and be a witness to a watching world. Like I said last Sunday, Spurgeon, I think it was, that said, I forget who it was again, who said that if you're a Christian, you're, you're either a missionary or you're an imposter. If you say, I'm a Christian, and I don't live every day thinking about how can I share the gospel with one more person, take inventory. Do you know the Lord? Or are you just church? Religion. Do we really, really know Jesus? Apostle Paul says, I want to know him. The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering.